I'm going to be reading from this book, uh, which my children have put together uh, with my readings. And uh, the first uh, story I will read to you uh, came from my children. And it's my trial for reading too much. It all began on a snowy morning when my young children were at home because there was no school. In North Carolina, <clears throat> when there is an inch of snow, everything closes down. They came into the kitchen where I was reading and sipping a cup of coffee. The oldest said, we are requiring you to come into the living room. They were all looking very serious, so off I went with them. They had a special chair in which I was told to sit and that I was a prisoner in the dock. I was told that I was on trial. The charge was reading books when I could, should be playing with my children. They had apparently been watching Perry Mason on television because I was informed that Janet, seven years old, was Perry Mason, Charlie, a venerable five-year-old, was the prosecuting attorney, and Nancy, age three, was the witness for the prosecution. As you might guess, I was speedily convicted and sentenced to spend a day playing with them. We had a wonderful day out in the snow. My second story is called Pumpkin Patch. Partly after I moved to North Carolina, just before one Halloween, I decided that my kids had never seen a pumpkin patch, so we would go out to find one. They were all eager, and as we usually had several extra kids along, the car was full. I drove out into Moore County and found a little general store beside the road. I went in and asked the proprietor where I could find a pumpkin patch. He said, well, look, lady, uh, you just go down the road in front of the store until you get to the third right driveway. You drive in there and you will find your pumpkin patch. I did just what he said. The driveway was rough and rutted and it was quite a way uh, to the shack at the end. I stopped and started to get it out, of, out of the car when a man burst out of the door with a shotgun aimed right at me. I stammered, I was just looking for your pumpkin patch. He said, nothing here for you. You get gone right now. I hung a speedy U-turn and got gone in a hurry. I went back and stormed into the store. Why did you send me there, I said. He said, lady, I thought you was funnin'. Never thought you'd go there. I said, the man there pointed a gun at me, the storekeeper said. He's got a couple of stills out there and uh, thought you was a revenuer. I'm glad you had all those kids along or he'd have shot you for sure. So we went back to the A&P pumpkin patch for our pumpkin. Later I found out what a still was. The next story is my first car. My first car was a Cadillac town car, which my husband bought for $100. I always believed that it had been used for funerals. It had room for all six of my children, and they liked playing in it when we weren't going someplace. <clears throat> there was room for the playpen between seats and room for the two jump seats to be pulled down. The children like to put flowers in the little vases on the sides. It was a bit hard to steer, but I was strong. I had one adventure because of the difficulty of uh, steering. We were driving up the road at night when I saw a car following me closely. I was concerned and kept looking in my rearview mirror. Suddenly blue lights began to flash and I pulled over. The policeman came over, looked at me, the two kids beside me, no seat belts in those days, the playpen, two more children, and the two in the back seat. He said, well, I thought you were drunk, 
but you have more problems than that. Where are you going? I told him I was headed for Chapel Hill, and he said, we'll escort you there. Drive that tank slowly and safely. We arrived in style. After about a year, as I was driving to the grocery store, one of the axles broke. It was quite loud and dramatic. We were all sorry to see our first car towed away. I decided the least I could do was write a small tribute to my first car from its own point of view. My first car would say, here I am, reduced to this, no flowers in my vases, a play, no play, a playpen in my spacious interior, no chauffeur but this woman who does drive me with some skill. It takes both, both to maneuver my creaky old cogs and fittings, and here are noisy children arguing about who gets the jump seat, who gets to sit in front, and who gets the throne-like back seat. In my days of shining glory, I had a smartly uniformed driver. The people who were ushered into my comfortable velvet seats were finely dressed ladies in silk and her satin gowns with feathered hats. They were fragrant with expensive perfume. The gentlemen in evening suits smelling of costly cigars spoke of mergers and stock and bond transactions. The conversations were quiet and measured. Then one day, much later, my owner told his lady that the market had crashed and there was nothing left and he was telling me that was the beginning of the end for me. I was sold to a funeral director to follow the hearses. There was still some dignity in this, although all the people riding in me were sad. Oh, once there were a couple who were wrangling about how to get more money from a will. They made everything seem much sadder to me. The, this family bought me for $100. Is this really my value? Perhaps being happy people, having happy people and children using me merrily to going from place to place should make me feel a little better. It does, I grudgingly concede. And here's a story called My Imaginary Doctor. A number of years ago, I had a book called The Well Body Book. It told of a number of things that one could do to be healthier. One of the things was self-hypnosis. One, mo <coughs> one morning I awakened early and decided I should try to conjure up my imaginary doctor. I did the breathing and meditating it was called for. I found myself in my chair across from the fireplace and the door that led to the room where we stored wood. Presently, that door opened, and an old American Indian woman emerged. I had expected a middle-aged male and was quite surprised. She walked to me and said, you were not expecting me and you were disappointed. I told her that I was surprised, and she said, is there anything I can do for you before I go? I asked her for her blessing. She put her hands on my head and talked in a language I didn't understand. Then she said she would always be with me and left. I awakened and felt quite calm and pleasant. Six months later, I signed up for a group session with a faith healer called Tamiko Smith. She was Japanese and was well regarded. The night of the meeting, about 30 of us were sitting in a circle on the floor. Tomiko came out, but she looked exactly like my imaginary American Indian doctor. I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, there was Tomiko, the Japanese leader of the group. At the break, I began to tell Tomiko what I had seen. She said, stop, don't say any more. I was embarrassed and stopped talking. When the break was over, Tomiko said, Carol has something to tell you. I said, oh, no, she doesn't. Tomiko asked me, please, to tell the group what had happened. So I did. Tomiko said that I didn't have any idea how important that had been to her. 
She said that when she was a teenager in Japan, she had her first ESP experience. She went into a trance and saw an old American Indian woman who told her that she would be her mentor throughout her life. This happened whenever she was healing. She married an American serviceman. When they moved to North Carolina, they found a house next to an American Indian cemetery. The old Indian woman had continued to be her mentor. Another experience with Tamiko Smith happened uh, sometime later. She said that she was going to uh, uh, hypnotize us and guide us in our thoughts. I decided that she couldn't hypnotize me, but suddenly I felt myself floating up and saw all our bodies and mine down on the floor. <clears throat> I felt so free and decided that I would go and see my dad, who died when I was five years old. <clears throat> I found myself on a rocky ledge with my father, holding out his arms to me. I ran over and we embraced. It felt so good to be in his arms again. I loved him so dearly. After a while, he began to let go, and I said, Daddy, I want to stay here with you. He said, Oh, no, it isn't time yet. I begged him to let me stay with him, but he gently pushed me away. I began to hear voices saying, It's time to come back. It's time to come back. Repeatedly, I found myself back in my body and felt a little sad. And this is a story I wrote when we first uh, started having that COVID thing. Um, um, and it's called uh, Viral Fun. Here we are, isolated, but the sun is shining and there are new leaves of soft green on the trees against the blue sky to entertain me. Of course, books, yoga, exercises, and meditation on the TV are there for me too. What are the rest of my fellow prisoners doing for fun? It was by chance that I decided to make a game of asking fun for me. A neighbor and I got on the elevator together. I asked him what he was doing to entertain himself with this COVID uh, um, isolation. He said, my wife and I have been taking slides since 1943 and putting them in a box to sort someday. The day has come and we are really enjoying it. What a good start. After that, several people said it was a great time to go deeper into genealogy and joy finding more about their ancestors. One friend was cleaning out her filing cabinets and found an old issue of the newspaper that had the write-up of my daughter Liz's wedding 44 years ago. I read it with delight and sent it on to her. A lady told me she had renewed her old battle with her computer and that so far the computer was winning. Another friend said she had enjoyed playing her recorder years ago but had put it away. Now she had it out and was practicing every day. Others had renewed playing the piano or the violin. What a joyful way to live these days. A man told me that he was working on his Rip Van Winkle pill so we could all take one and wake up when the virus was over. I told my son about that and he countered, I'm working on a no side effects pill that kills the virus. A neighbor caught in the recycling room said, I have just returned from my daily 15 mile bicycle ride. I think he gets a prize for keeping physically fit. The tennis players have been able to play on the Orange County courts. Um, um, one frustrated looking lady said, I've been working on my to-do list. I don't seem to be making much progress. People in the cottages and those with garden plots are having a wonderful time digging in the dirt and planting things. Okay. Um, I have a Another story here.
This is a story that I have. Uh, um, I wrote on June 2nd, 2008. One of the many advantages of being older is the amount of unstructured time available for us to use as we choose. Part of my time has been used to think about what I believe, my spiritual journey. However, I know that it will change as it has continued to change <clears throat> through the years. So here is today's. The liberal congregational church in which I grew up was an important part of my life. Uh, the fundamentalist uh, preacher, uh, my, my fundamentalist mother, preached sin and guilt. But in church, I heard things that made more sense to me as a child and teenager. Other Protestant churches to which I belonged through the years taught things I couldn't accept, but I felt that being forced to lie about too many things, uh, I was forced to lie about too many things within the place they called God's home. The Unitarian Church and Yoga came into my life at about the same time. What I learned in both was that the things I was thinking, feeling, needing were all right, were good. Yoga taught that mind, body, and spirit were intertwined, that competing with others was self-defeating, that striving to meet each challenge to the best of one's ability brings feelings of achievement, that joy can be found in being attentive to each moment. The Unitarian Church agreed with this and has continued to add new insights using the wisdom of all religions. Through the years, I have developed a series of words upon which I reflect each morning using my meditation prayer. Peace is the first word I mention. I have found that without peace within my spirit, I, um, I'm unable to... Uh, um, have peace with my family, community, or the world. Two years in the Peace Corps showed me clearly that even when I came to a country and a people in a time of peace, it was difficult to deal with some of the people and events in a peaceful way. I pray daily for peace within. A second word is love. I have five children with spouses, 10 grandchildren, some with spouses, 23 great-grandchildren and um, counting, and many friends whom I can love and respect all the time and like and agree with sometimes. I know that they return my love and respect when they can. I want to continue to give and receive love. Joy is the third word. There are so many things to be joyful about and grateful for each day. Starting with good health, many things that give me joy are in nature. Um, sunrises, clouds, flowers, trees, birds, rocks, the ocean, stars, all bring joy and thanks to my spirit. And there are people with ideas, uh, smiles and hugs to share. Books, music and art are all available to me. What riches. If I don't find joy, I have stopped looking. Kindness is something that I had to learn to value. When I was young, I thought that quick wit, clever repartee, and superior intelligence were the most important act attributes to be found in people. Through the years, I've learned that wit and a facile tongue are often used at the expense of the feelings of others. They often wound. I began to work to curb my tongue. It is a continuing struggle, but each day I pray to be kind. Practicing helps. Power is the next word I consider. The two women in my life whom I saw as powerful were my mother and my mother-in-law. Um, the um, um, Both women often seem to be destructive and cruel with their use of power. I did not want power as I perceived it used by them. As I have lived and observed, I have found that power can be used for good, 
Now the sense that power is available for me to use constructively is exhilarating and freeing. I like feeling like a powerful woman. Forgiveness comes next. It took me a long time to realize that forgiveness is more for me than any way I'm working to forgive. I have found that it clears out anger and bitterness from my spirit. It frees me for the thoughts and feelings I enjoy and want to live with. It helps me to be forgiven. I pray for each member of my family and for everyone I know that needs healing, loving thoughts sent out to them. I give thanks for all the people in my life. Occasionally, my prayers are for someone I don't like or agree with or who doesn't like me. There seems to be some sort of magic about continuing to mention this person's name that uh, brings a chord and sometimes creates a friendship. I have um, I realized that my list of goals, for want of a better name, is growing. At the beginning of this journey, I found myself asking, is this what you really want all the time? The answer turned out to be yes. What a surprise. Um, and uh, here's one um, that I, I thought you might like. Um, um, after I'd seen the doctor about my ailing knee, I looked at the brochure they gave me about all the surgical procedures they do on knees. I saw how they saw off some bones and pound more things into other bones, and I thought, spare me the details. Then I remembered the first time I ever heard that saying. When I was a society lady in Pinehurst, it was at that time the style to have one's hair done with jello to get that bouffant look. Forgive me if I pause with a shudder. A dance at the country club let me show off my new gown and my new hairdo. The man with whom I was dancing said I looked very pretty. I said, well, thank you. You know, I had my hair done with je cherry jello today. And he said, spare me the details. Nice, smart man. And um, let's see here. This one is called Angels in Disguise. <clears throat> I began to practice the angel, excuse me. <clears throat> I began to practice the angels in disguise around me when I flew off to Utah for a granddaughter's wedding. As I was getting ready to go, I exchanged purses, my small everyday one, for a large one in which I could carry food, a book, and other necessities for airplane travel. I carefully put my driver's license, one must have a photo ID, in an inside pocket, lipstick and a comb in another. A friend called on the phone to wish me bon voyage just as I was leaving. Then I was back went back to my purse and added my lunch, a book, and some munchies. I was ready to go. The only thing I forgot, as I discovered when I got to Dallas, was cash and a credit card. I ate my banana and peanut butter sandwich and uh, uh, tried to find money for a drink. Oh well, I went to a concession stand and asked the woman for a cup of water. She gave it to me and asked me what else I wanted. I said I had already eaten and added in fun. I seem to have forgotten my money. Um, anyway, Sandra, angel number one, told me that she would be glad to fix me anything she had without charge. I assured her that I wasn't hungry. 
but she came around the counter and offered to buy me anything from another booth if I didn't like Taco Bell. I finally convinced her that I had eaten. I told her I would never forget her, and I haven't. Another group of angels appeared on a Sunday morning at Montreat, North Carolina. I was on my way to my to visit my daughter in Nashville. I had packed my car with gifts for the children and things to take to my daughter. I drove up toward Asheville and thought a good place to stop for gas. The car was full all right, but among all the other things I didn't find was a purse. So there I was with no money again. I drove to the first church I saw. It was about 1030 and they said that the minister was in his study and could see me for a moment. I went in and told my story to the minister and the assembled elders. I asked if I could borrow $20. That would more than fill the gas tank in those days. Every wallet came out and I had tears in my eyes as I accepted $40 to be paid, paid back on my way home. I drove very carefully without a driver's license and paid the money back happily. I'll never forget those kindly donors either. During a, a Danube River trip, I became even more aware of the angels all around me. On our way home from sightseeing, my husband got on the metro and the doors closed. I was alone in downtown Vienna. I did know the place where the boat we were on was moored. So with my halting German, I found the way to what I thought was the right stop. It wasn't and I was lost on a towpath along the river. But then I met Gerda, who was with a group of other college students, and a big pit bull named Oof. She spoke English, and they all walked uh, over two miles with me and stayed with me until we found my ship, uh, not too long after that. Angel Anya, our tour leader, rescued me and I believe saved my life after my husband's uh, accidental death on a train in Budapest. When I got home, my, suddenly, my children suddenly sprouted wings before my eyes as they cared for me. I keep finding angels around me every day. If you haven't seen any angels lately, look in the mirror, look in the mirror. That's where you'll find angels. This one was called Stealing. Uh, the other night after a movie, we saw two people laden with boxes and bags in the foyer of our residence trying to get out the front door. I said laughingly, are you trying to rob the place? The man said, you bet. We robbed our mother of all this stuff and was she happy. We helped them with the door and off they went. This brought to mind an event at Duke. I was working the evening shift, which was almost over when a man in a white coat came in with a big laundry ham, a large, large laundry hamper. He went up and down the hall, disconnecting and loading up television sets. When asked, he said they were being taken out for cleaning. When the laundry hamper was full and he was ready to leave, someone asked him when he would be, they would be back. He said, I'm not sure. Someone helped him um, wheel the heavy hamper onto the elevator. The television sets were never seen again. Let's see. I think I've, I have um, uh, something I have not read to you. 
I read to you here. Um, The speech. At first, the speaker's words were fascinating. We must accept and come to terms with the shadow side of our nature. The therapist who avoids answering a client's questions is not necessarily practicing good psychoanalysis. He is sometimes simply being rude. Then the subject became more involved and began to focus on the needs of the therapist. Soon the behavior of the speaker became more interesting than the words he was saying. He leaned on the podium with his right hand, um, holding his left elbow with his left hand, holding his right. A few more words and his right hand went up and he put his right index finger into his right ear. After a, a burrowing there a bit, he pushed up his glasses, which had slid quite far down his nose. This repeated fairly often. Apparently, having the glasses slip down his nose made an ear itch. When he made a point, I knew it because his voice rose, and he made a number of interesting gestures, which I enjoyed. A special thought called forth both hands, which were held at waist level, as if holding a football. A joke, I heard one so could identify the behavior, was accompanied by a toss of the right hand with the fingers flicking open and closed. Both hands held up with palms raised and fingers opening gradually showed an offering of facts. When he reached the end of a section of thought or ideas, he gathered up his papers, tapped them on the podium to straighten them, making sure all the edges were together. He then replaced the papers and launched on a new set of ideas. A thought process of this member of the audience had been um, uh, hopelessly lost soon after the part of the lecture, so it seemed that taking note of the speaker's appearance offered grist for the writer's mill and a lot of fun. He was medium-sized and rather stocky. His shirt was white with woven vertical stripes. His trousers were brown and he wore a belt. He had quite a paunch which brought up uh, the always interesting thought of what powers kept the belt and the trousers from slipping down. He wore a tie which he loosened more and more as the evening wore on. It was olive green with tiny rose spots with cream colored uh, centers. I was sitting near the front, obviously. His hair was black and white and worn along in the back. His beard was neatly trimmed and had interesting patches of black and white. Words suddenly surfaced. Jung was the first person who posited the existence of common archetypes. When one is a member of a creative writing class, no lecture needs to be dull. And then I forgot to, uh, all right, thank you. Um, Winter. It may be balmy when you read this, but on the day this was written, the thermometer was 15 degrees. We had just had about three inches of snow, which always shuts everything down in North Carolina. It got into single-digit temperatures afterward, which happily was rare here down south. My bond friend George Chandler and I got talking about our youth in Wisconsin. He remembered a month in which the temperature was 10 degrees below zero or less for a month. His college roommate had a down jacket, but George had no warm winter wear. They had classes at different times, so the jacket was shared. He also remembered the snowdrifts, which were higher than our cars. I remember that very well. People began, uh, uh, 
um, began to put bright colored tennis balls atop their radio antennas so they could see, uh, be seen at corners. Both of us remembered going to school in layers of clothing so that, uh, um, and so that, uh, and we remembered one teacher who hung all our damn clothes on the radiators in the room and the smell of drying wool. I remember wearing long underwear and long stockings um, held up by a garter belt. When we got to school, we rushed to roll up the long underwear. I have a picture of myself standing on a snowdrift holding my hand above the telephone wires. I also remember two-day blizzards. On the morning after, the huge snowdrifts were sparkling like diamonds. The temperature was always below zero. All the kids put on layers of clothing and hats and several scarves until only our eyes showed and then went out to play. It was fun. Uh, but I had my fill of snow and cold. I'm happy to be in North Carolina where a few days of winter makes us appreciate all the great weather we enjoy. And that is from my book. Thank you.